Thank you all. So I asked Terrence earlier for Ben's birthday what he would want to hear about now. And he said that Ben really loves the confluence of finance and HR. <laughs> and wants to hear about making the case for people investments in this increasingly volatile world. So we are here for Ben right now to deliver. Um, what we're really trying to talk about here are two things that are going on at once. On the one hand, the world has become more volatile in so many different ways. We'll talk about how that's affected your industries. And on the other hand, the employee experience and the employee's demand for that experience has really gone up over the last few years. And being a numbers person, I actually spent many years working with finance people myself. Um, I uh, looked up some numbers. And from the Edelman Trust Barometer Special Report on Trust at Work, they find that 83% of workers cited career progression and 80% personal empowerment as considerations or deal breakers in their job evaluation. And that that trust issue was even greater with frontline workers. Confidence in their employer is nine points lower among deskless workers than, workers, uh, than desk workers. And so I want to talk about both of those, those sides uh, and how you bring that together in the HR investments that you make and then how you make the case for those investments. And joining me on stage are three wonderful leaders. Um, Beth Biggs serves as Group Vice President of Benefits Employee Services Center at Charter Communications, a leading broadband connectivity company serving more than 32 million customers in 41 states uh, through its Spectrum brand. As head of benefits, she is responsible for strategy, design, and delivery of Charter's health and insurance, well-being, and retirement products. And she also leads the HR operational functions for the Employee Services Center and support of Charter's 101,000 employees, including onboarding and leaves, among others. She also lives in Chesterfield, Missouri, with her husband, teenage son, and what I'm sure is an adorable Labradoodle, because they all are. <laughs> they all are. <laughs> Welcome, Beth. Now, Tamla, you've met already on this very stage, but she serves as EVP at USAA and Chief Human Resources Officer. USAA is among the leading providers of insurance, banking, investment, and retirement solutions to more than 13 million members of the US military, veterans who have honorably served in their families, and notably not Ron Rob Gronkowski, right? Um, notably. <laughs> and as CHRO, Tamla provides strategic leadership for all aspects of USAA's people strategy and support of the business. She's a purpose-driven, innovative leader with nearly 30 years of diverse experience and a strong track record of delivering results across multiple industries, business life cycles, and geographies. Welcome, Tamla. Thank you. And Sarah King serves as Darden Restaurant's Chief People and Diversity Officer. A member of Darden's executive team, she leads the execution of Darden's people strategy, as well as building organizational capability and employee culture to further enable Darden's growth. She's responsible for all aspects of HR functions within Darden, including oversight of the HR organizations within each of Darden's operating companies. Prior to joining Darden Restaurants, Sarah spent 20 years in HR leadership positions for a global hotel company, living and working on four different continents, which sounds like a really great topic for our reception later. Uh, <laughs> sounds fantastic. Stories. <laughs> Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. So I want to start by tackling this kind of two sides of the, of the theme. Um, we hear about market disruption that shows up in each of your spaces a little bit differently. Um, and at the same time, we, we know that employee expectations are rising. So, for each of you, what are the challenges and disruptions your business is facing as a business more holistically? And how is that resulting in changing expectations for employees in your organization? Sarah, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, 
So for us, just to context what we do, because most people haven't heard of Darden restaurants, we have three different segments that we operate in. Uh, we have casual dining, bar brands, and fine dining, and I'm pretty sure anybody in here with the corporate Amex has been to one of our fine dining brands, and I'm pretty sure anybody that's been a soccer parent has been to Olive Garden or <laughs> one of our casual dining brands. And so we own and operate uh, 2,000 restaurants, um, and we have about 200,000 employees, so it's been quite an interesting few years, to say the least. And so for us right now, because we've got all these different segments, um, the, the ongoing question about is there going to be a recession, is there not, are we in one, did we already have one and we missed it, um, and, and, and what's all that doing to consumer sentiment and consumer behaviour is very interesting for us, um, because that has a different impact on each of our segments. Our casual dining brands do really well when there's recessionary environment. Our fine dining brands were on fire last year after everybody decided to you know, start traveling again. So we're just watching the macro environment to see what's going to happen because it has an impact on you know, how our segments perform. And we're a public company, so we have that responsibility as well to our shareholders. Internally, I think the biggest shift for us is that, you know, in a post-pandemic world, um, our hourly team members came out of it with different expectations. Um, and the number one thing that I think we've seen is flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have a frontline workforce, they don't have the option to work from home. And I'm so glad that that is not a topic at this conference because I'm sick to death of talking about it. <laughs> I won't break um, it up, <laughs> And so, you know, their expectation around flexibility is different than, you know, folks sitting in front of a computer in an office building. So we've really had to, I guess, shift our paradigm about what it means to manage an hourly workforce. Uh, and actually, we work with Gallup, and they tell us that flexibility is the new engagement currency, particularly in a frontline environment. Mm -hmm. That's great. Tell her. So for me, um, I'm hoping that we have some USA members out in the, the room. There you go. There you go. Thank oh, you for your membership, and thank you for your service if you've served. Um, USAA, as you know, is both uh, an insurance company and a bank. So how many of you have experienced insurance premiums going up? All of us. Um, and so if you think about what's happened as a result of COVID, you have, and, and then climate change. So COVID had supply chain impacts in terms of our ability to repair things in a timely fashion, but be it cars as well as homes. And then you have uh, things going on in the climate that's unpredictable, so climate change, and we're having more storms and more weathers and things like that, ultimately leading to more claims in homes and getting those claims resolved with supply chain issues creates challenges. So, you know, the catastrophic issues that we're having is creating challenges. And then we also have a bank, so interest rates and inflation and things of that nature is driving, you know, challenges in that regard. You know, the cost of owning a home, so you don't have many people buying homes anymore or borrowing money because of the interest rates. So we have all of that. And you know, our goal is to empower our members to achieve financial security through competitive products, exceptional service, and trusted advice. Competitive products, you know, competitive meaning cost competitive. We have over five generations of members, and the members that we have want to be served differently. I think the, the, the older generation, they're used to, you know, um, they're very endured to the company, right? And they're used to talking to member service representatives to service them. And, and our service is known as our secret sauce, and, you know? But then you have this new generation, Gen Z members, that are very price sensitive and they don't have the same level of affinity. And so we are, you know, trying to balance cost and efficiency um, and serving our members with excellence while maintaining the integrity of our brand and what makes us great. And so that's kind of the, the economic challenges that we're facing. And then I would say along the same lines as Darting is facing, you know, people came out of the pandemic expecting something different from their employers, right? So flexibility is one. Our employees are not as happy about RTO. That's been a huge bone of contention for us. Um, they fought because they didn't want to go home and now they're fighting to return. But we also found that um, our employees are better equipped to serve our members when they are together and they can learn and grow. We hired a lot of people during COVID and we trained them online and it doesn't have the same impact. And if our secret sauce is serving our members with excellence, we have to have member service representatives that can do that. So we've had some challenges with respect to RTO and they've been very vocal about that. Um, and so they expect more flexibility. They wanna have more say in terms of where the company is going. They're, they want more transparency. 
And if they can't get it from within the company, they go outside the company to talk about what's going on. So it's, it's, it's a lot of volatility going on in the world today, but employees have a voice and it's not muted. And they have so many different ways of communicating in and out of context that can change a company's brand. So we're trying to manage that. But it's still a phenomenal company. We are so committed to our mission and it is a privilege to work in the organization. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Beth? All right, well, let's see. So um, we're leading broadband, so think of your internet, uh, but we're also video as well as Spectrum Mobile. Um, we were just talking today at lunch, but one of our biggest, biggest bu business challenges has to do with how the video landscape has been evolving. Mm. Um, we got to talking about, uh, do you remember the days, right, when you used to go to Blockbuster as a family on Friday or Saturday night? <laughs> you had your kids, and it was like your <laughs> weekly event, right? You went, yeah. you picked out, there was a whole process around selecting the video that you're going to get. Everybody got their snacks, and you got the big bucket of popcorn that you do in the microwave, all of those things, right? It was part of what you did as a family. Um, and that was the days when we had Netflix that was actually, that was when they would mail you the I DVD <laughs> to your home, right? And then you would have to mail it back. And it was kind of a blip that, oh yeah, you couldn't go online and really do anything with Netflix. My how things have changed, right? Um, so certainly we live in a world with that changing dynamic and when we think about what consumers want today they really only want to pay for the content that they want to consume mm -hmm. don't blame them right as personal consumers that's what we look for as well but we also have programming contracts that make us take much more than maybe what we want to purchase uh, and that drives up the cost of our business so we're really working hard with our programming partners to really evolve the whole video landscape and delivering to our consumers a product that's what they want to receive at a price point that they want to pay um, so that's really transformational mm -hmm. in our industry um, and it's exciting to see where some of those things are going to go over time it certainly is changing um, broadband is obviously where it's all at and so when we think about our network expansion uh, just to put it in context, and is anybody familiar with like the rural broadband development, RDOF? I, I see a few heads nodding, okay. So we've been one of the biggest winners of awards for broadband build out, and we've been uh, one of the most successful going out and building, a, mm -hmm. building out our network, our plant, to meet even more underserved, unserved communities across the United States. Um, we're in 41 different states, so that's a pretty big market. Uh, the pace that we're doing that build, build out is actually going to double this year. So we're looking to accelerate the speed by which we're taking those services out into the rural communities. Uh, where if you think about it today, some of them are still doing DSL. <laughs> um, and that we all remember what that was like. That's truly what they're living with today. So it's transformational for those communities where we operate. Um, but in context, this is a $5 billion investment by charter to build out to more than 31, or I'm sorry, to 1 million additional customers just in the next few years. So how that's changed what we're doing internally is it's created, number one, a whole new team of underground, underground construction uh, workers. It's going into a completely new space with aerial construction that we haven't ever been in before. So this is building out our whole talent strategy around this new skill set. Um, much more trades focused and how do we help uh, endear ourselves to that type of population. Many of them are going into Lyman colleges today, so we're building out a whole strategy around that. We're starting with kind of outsourcing some of that work. We have limited resources internally that do it and really have a really quick trajectory of how we're going to upskill our own workers as well as uh, bring those folks in-house. So we're working on that. That's an exciting one, but that's going to go deliver, like I said, broadband services to over a million new customers near term. So that's really exciting for us. I'd say the other business challenge that we face, um, even though it's an HR challenge as well, but you know, it's how we support the business, turnover. Um, our turnover is uh, high, especially when we think about our frontline workers. Um, in that very first year of hi hire, we have the highest uh, turnover within that group. We always say if we can get them to the three-year mark, they're here to stay. Um, so getting them to that three-year mark, and we're doing a lot of different initiatives right now within the HR team to address that kind of first year of hire experience to make sure that it's consistent across our organization. Um, it's hard, right, when you've got such a geographically dispersed population, so many different kind of lines of business within Charter. 
Um, it's, a, it's a challenge and an opportunity all at the same time, and I think it's one that as we look to solve it, it's going to help bring tremendous value and uh, add to the bottom line. Employees are absolutely expecting something different today from us than they were even just a few years ago. Um, so we're continuing to work towards that, and we'll talk a little bit about it as we're up here today, kind of our investing in you campaign and what that's meant to our employees. But we truly believe that through our investing in our employees that we're going to be able to address some of these emerging needs, new needs uh, that we're seeing. They don't just look for us to provide competitive pay, great benefits anymore. They're looking for career opportunities. They don't want a, just a job. They want to know how you're going to help them grow and what that's going to mean to their employees or to their families back at home. Um, so that's kind of what we're working to change the narrative about. So I hear consistency, actually, in all of your answers, even in very different spaces with very different challenges around that flexibility, mm -hmm. that need for reskilling, yep. the career focus. I'm wondering what big bets you're thinking about from an HR perspective. And Tamla, maybe we can start with you. What, what experimental or new features, policies, programs has your team initiated? And how are you thinking about the data to ma measure and gather the effectiveness of that. Well, I just took a big bet today. I Did you? Guild. I think I heard about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is my second employer launch with Guild. So, oh. um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a Guilder, I guess. Um, so a couple of things that we've done before I got here, I can't take credit for this. We've been investing in our workforce for quite some time because you know that that is our secret sauce, if you will, that's probably not so secret anymore. Um, our employees were, you know, really vocal about their inability and they didn't have time to develop themselves, right? You know, we had all these great programs out there, but no time for them to utilize them. So last year before I joined the company, we announced 32 hours of development hours above and beyond their PTO where they could just focus on development. So that was last year. Fast forward to this year, um, we just announced in, during our annual enrollment that we're doing a couple different things, and I'll talk about Guild in just a minute. Um, we are, some, some employees are talking about they can't go back to school and pay for college because, or pay for retirement, excuse me, because they're investing in their, four, I mean, they're, they can't do 401k because they're investing in paying their schooling, right? So we just launched this week as a part of our annual enrollment ability for those persons who have student loans to pay back, that a portion of that will be, go towards their 401k match. And so that's huge. So you don't have to decide whether or not I'm gonna pay my student loan back or if I'm gonna invest in my retirement. We're giving them the ability to do both. And they were like, this can't be true. I mean, they mm. literally ask us, every, this can't be true. Are you serious? And they want to see all the documents to make sure this is true. Um, <laughs> but we, we want them to invest in their financial security for the long term, not just short. And so we're creating programs that will enable them to do that. Um, so that's a big one that we've uh, launched. And then, as I said before, today we just launched our guild program. It's called Advantage. And Advantage is not going to only be a learning opportunity for our employees to take you know, advantage of, but as I did in my last employer, we also announced that their dependents will be able to take advantage of that as well. And so, yeah. And again, they said, this can't be true. <laughs> This can't be true, but we believe in investing in the whole family so that they can to uh, be financially secure. And you know, being an HR person that's really tied to finance, I had to sell it to my CFO. Um, and I said, you know, when you invest in the family, you can focus on retaining talent. You know, we were experiencing unprecedented turnover at USAA. It used to be single digits single digits and you know during COVID and post COVID it's gotten up to still not bad comparatively speaking but it's now double digit and that's causing some pause for concerns and so I went to our CFO first and talked to them about this program and I said you know you know if you invest not only in the employee but their family it will prolong their retention here with us. One, it will you know, get them interested in coming to work for us because we're providing a benefit not only to them, but they, their, their dependents can go to school on us as well. And then they tend to stay longer. You know, I do the math, if, every, if, if an employee has 2.3 kids and those kids are in school at different times and they join us, then they're gonna stay until their kid is out of school 
if they need the financial support. And that's for our frontline employees and they need that. And so that is a program that we just launched. And so we're trying to be creative in terms of programs that maintain the integrity of who we are, but also gives our employees financial stability and security so that they can in turn support our members. And so we've been creative in that regard. And then the other thing that we're working on um, is part in partnership with finance is strategic workforce planning because we've been of the mindset that we will, you know, kind of just in time hire or just in time develop. And I don't know how many of you have gotten this headcount game mastered, but as smart as we are, we can't count heads, <laughs> you know? And so we are gonna be more focused on strategic workforce planning, understanding where our business is going, the skills that are required, when we need the skills, how many do we need, et cetera, so that we can look at our investments in learning and talent development to make sure it's meeting the company at its, at its point of need when you need it so that when that talent is needed, that talent is already upskilled and available for that. And so we don't spend a lot of time hiring, turn, you know, turning people over because they're not fit for purpose. And so we are working hand in hand with our business leaders to make sure we get better at strategic workforce planning. So we're hiring when we need to, what we need to, and we are putting in programs to develop the talent that's gonna need the skills for tomorrow. So those are some of the things that we're doing that's pretty creative. It's super interesting, like all three of those things have this holistic element yeah. to them, mm -hmm. right? Solving the student debt problem with long-term financial planning mm -hmm. and with removing debt yep. that new folks would need to go back to school. And then thinking about the holistic family mm -hmm. approach and thinking about holistically the workforce planning for the future, it's, yeah. it's great. Beth, how about you? Yeah, those are great. I'm like taking some notes. <laughs> are you guys taking notes? I know I am. Um, so I would say for us as an organization, um, we've had a longstanding commitment to investing in our employees. It's funny though, that when you br finally brand something and you start talking about it under one umbrella, so that's our Investing in You campaign that we launched last year. My, how it's resonated now that mm -hmm. we call it something and they know what it means, but we really put all of our people investments under that one umbrella of investing in you. And like I said, we launched it last fall um, and we made significant investments both in pay and benefits. Uh, and for the 10th consecutive year, we fully absorbed the annual cost increase of our healthcare program. So we're keeping employees cost flat. So access and affordability are really mm -hmm. so important to us, not just in the healthcare space, but also in the education space. Um, and what we've seen just since that uh, launch last fall is a 10 percentage 10 basis point reduction in our voluntary turnover. Mm -hmm. So it's making a difference. Yeah. Um, so when you talk to your finance people yes. and they're asking about the ROI, always go back to the data. That's right. If you don't have a story that, that is supported by data, they're gonna look at you and tell you that you're just talking about fluff. As an HR person, <laughs> they wanna see what it's gonna do and how it's gonna drive the bottom line for the organization. Um, and this year it was super exciting that, you know, what we introduced on August 1st was our new education benefit that's powered by Guild. Um, and it's been off to the races and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but I'm excited to see from that data point forward, what's next? How is that gonna help both with attraction, with retention? How is it gonna help us really um, support that investing in new initiative that's really all about attracting, rewarding, developing our talent? with the specific purpose of extending the tenure of our frontline workforce, which is about two thirds, th two thirds of our organization. And that's all because we know that a charter employee versus a contractor is gonna take better care of our customers. Uh, and the longer they're with us, the better skilled and trained they are to do their job and to deliver that secret sauce of great customer service. So that's what we're going for. We want to extend the tenure of our frontline workforce and we're coming up with all of these different ways to support them towards that goal. I love that. Mm -hmm. It seems like a theme throughout the day too. Christopher talked about that earlier, yes, like yeah. work back from the stuff that you wanna here, provide to companies. your customers mm -hmm. into yep. what you need to do for your mm -hmm. employees. Mm -hmm. yep. Sarah, I'm, I'm curious from you, this, this whole event is centered around creating cultures of opportunity. You literally have the word opportunity right about that. <laughs> um, what does that mean for you personally, and how does that, what does that look like at Darden? So personally, um, listening to the stories this morning uh, really resonated with me. I'm from New Zealand, and I didn't go to college, and technically I am an immigrant. Um, and so I'm, I'm hearing all these stories, and I'm thinking about my own journey, and you know, I 
for whatever reason, I just never went to college and it wasn't the same culture where I grew up and then I just started working and then my career took off and I was telling somebody earlier, it wasn't until I came to this country that I experienced what I call college degree snobbery, <laughs> um, which is real, people. Yeah. Um, some of it was ver really you know, subtle and some of it was frankly quite overt, mm. um, which is how Rachel and I got uh, when we met, got into a pretty heated debate about the need for college education versus a more broad-based skill, skill base. I still don't have a college degree, and I'm, you know, sitting in the C-suite at a Fortune 500 company, so I think that ship has sailed. I don't think I'm going to go back to school anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> um, <And that's> <laughs> thank you. Um, and so I spent the first 10 years of my working life working in restaurants, so I find it quite serendipitous that I'm, you know, hopefully finishing my career working for a, a great restaurant company. And because of my personal experiences, I have this really strong desire to make sure that whatever people need to be successful, whatever that is, is something that we can, we can offer. And I think one of the reasons I've spent my whole career in the hospitality industry is, you know, it's a little bit of the land of misfit toys and <laughs> you get people from all walks of life. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in this um, room that, you know, worked in restaurants at some point. It teaches you great life skills. Uh, it teaches you great work ethic. Um, but I think one of the best things about the industry is it creates opportunity for people that maybe didn't think that that was part of their story. And Sherry's story earlier for me really, you know, I, I was like, where's the tissues? Um, because we have 200,000 employees, 99.9% .9 of those work in the restaurants, and most of them start in entry-level hourly jobs. Um, a lot of uh, uneducated, you know, formerly uneducated folks. And we've built a system that allows for them to grow their career with us. Um, it's very structured. You know, we're in high growth mode. We're op opening, sorry, 50 to 60 restaurants a year, so we need to build teams to be able to open all those restaurants. And so we created this sort of internal pathway across all 10 of our brands that you can, you know, our CEO started as a busboy at Red Lobster. And, you know, his story is incredible. And there's a lot more of, of those stories out there. So we've built a very intentional mm -hmm. system where we show the career path for our hourly team members. Um, we've got very internally built training programs to go from, you know, an hourly team member to what we call a professional, to a trainer, to a manager in training. Um, and once they get to that manager in training point, then 100% of our promotions to general manager are from within, and 100% to directors are from within, and 100% to SVPs are within. And more than half of our executive team started working as a busboy, host, dishwasher, whatever it was called. It was back in the day when you had paper resumes and no internet. So, you know, that's how long ago it was for most of us. And so I think we have a lot of pride in creating this, this pathway for people to know that they can be anything they want to be, especially when you see, you know, a CEO that is a Cuban immigrant that runs a $12 billion company. It's pretty fascinating. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I, I've heard a couple of times in here thinking about the longer term mm -hmm. approach to building talent over time. And Sarah, what you described, I think, is a great example of that investment over time that pays off. But we're always balancing the longer term and the shorter term. And I think in volatile times and when you're kind of working with finance partners, I think those are some of the times that you might get more of the short term pressures mm -hmm. to go with the long term benefits. So Beth, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. How do you balance the immediate with the long term, focusing on both this urgent need mm -hmm. that Tamla talked about of, we got to hire now, we got to retain people now, with the longer term piece that, that Sarah was talking about now? Yeah, it's, you know, we're always trying to strike the balance. I think for me, over the course of my career, and, and as you mentioned, you know, I lead the benefits team as well as some of the HR operational functions at Charter, and I've been there for almost 14 years, so I've had the benefit of seeing the evolution over time, which is one of the tidbits that I tell people that are newer to just, you know, working. Don't just leave for greener grass. If you stay, you'll get the opportunity to see how things grow and change over time and influence that. But I think you have to keep the long term in focus. And then what you do is you make incremental improvements over time that suit and serve short-term needs. Okay. So not everything happens overnight. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that. You have to continue to advocate for your employees um, and what it is that you're trying to build for them internally, that longer-term vision uh, of where you want to take the organization. 
Um, for us, uh, I think talent is a great example of where you have to balance the two. So attracting talent is certainly a short-term goal and need that we have, and getting them to stay is our longer-term objective. Uh, I think you have the best case scenario when you have an initiative that really serves both needs. Mm -hmm. And I think our new education benefit is certainly um, it fits that space perfectly, right? So we intend that the program is going to help both help us attract new talent to the organization. It's going to help us grow talent from within. So kind of that internal ta talent pipeline, we've got over 100,000 employees. Uh, many of them are sitting in call centers or they're out in the field doing connections. Um, for us, they could be out in the field doing sales for us, so that's some really tough jobs. Um, and perhaps they haven't had the educational opportunities to really unlock the doors and they have no idea where to start, right? So that's where Guild comes in. That's where the coaches come in, is to help them understand the career pathways. How do you go from being a customer service representative in a call center to a director of IT? You know, until we had this program, we had no clear way to show them what that career pathway looked like. So we're looking for this to really unlock those, uh, the talent from within. And we'll, long-term ROA is important for our accounting folks and our finance partners. And we'll certainly continue to monitor the performance of the program and track metrics uh, to make sure that that happens. Um, but you know, early results are looking good. Mm -hmm. So we just launched, like I said, on August 1st, um, and just to share a few tidbits on how well it's been received from our workforce so far, 35% um, of them have already created an account profile mm -hmm. in two months. 12% uh, of them have already submitted an application. So for some of you who are doing the math, so 12%. <laughs> and almost four, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 of them have already come, become enrolled learners in some type of program. Wow. That's great. So it's, <laughs> it's we're so excited. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're excited about the next steps because yeah. the magic is what it translates mm -hmm. to over time, is the opportunities to move within our organization to grow into a field that maybe they didn't even have any idea how to go into before. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And, and one of the things we talk about when we talk about why has Charter's program come out so strong out of the gate, gotten so much engagement, is the focus on career pathways. Mm -hmm. And you really put that front and center in your launch. And so for those of you who are thinking about that topic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Beth's a great person to talk about, uh, talk yeah. to about that as well. It's, yeah. it's really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, great. So. I have one more big, yeah, I'm looking at the clock. I have one more big topic that I want to make sure we get to, which is the relationship between the HR team and the CFO and how that's changed over time. And I'd love to maybe start with you, Tamla, and then we can, we can go around uh, and all three of you can, can give your perspective. So in this climate of volatility and of economic anxiety that Sarah started out talking about this is it isn't a recession environment, um, but also where talent shortage is still at the top of the list of priorities for you and for CEOs. Uh, how has that changed the dynamic between HR and finance, and how have your conversations with your CFO shifted? Well, I've been very fortunate. Again, I grew up in GE, and so <laughs> HR and finance were like the two legs of the three-legged stool. You know, if you've read anything about Jack Welch, so I'd, I've never really had that dynamic, that finance versus HR, because nothing happens without financial capital and human capital. Your most important asset and your biggest expense are people, right? So, you know, finance has a vested interest in that. So, um, you know, I've been working with my CFO at USAA and it's been a great relationship. We are partnering on, even on strategic workforce planning. The other thing we're partnering on is unit cost analysis, really trying to get more granularity in terms of how much our products and services are costing the organization. So you speak their language, like mm -hmm. really speak their language. How much does it cost you to perform this service? And is there a more effect, one, do we need the service after you get the cost? Do you need the service? Secondly, if you do, is there a more efficient way of doing it? And three, what does that involve? And then fourth, what is the impact on the organization? So we are partnering on several key initiatives that it involves both of us partnering together to move the company forward. And so I've been very fortunate to be able to have the relationship both in the past and currently with my finance partner. So I haven't experienced the 
us versus them because again, I think COVID taught us a lot too, that your most important asset are your people. And if you don't have the right people in the right roles with the right skills performing at the right level, then it can undermine the integrity of the, the brand and, and your ability to perform, right? So it's been uh, you know, a, a good partnership so far. Wonderful. Sarah. Well, I think my CFO is actually a little scared of me, so that um, <laughs> <laughs> so Why is that? <laughs> Wonder. Don't tell. Don't tell. There's no alphas up here. Um, so, you know, that's a, when I was thinking about the answer to that question, when I started, I, I fell into HR. It was completely accidental. I didn't even know what it was when I started working in HR. Um, and my first boss was uh, a, a former CFO, and I made a comment about, well, I don't really, you know, I'm in HR, we don't worry about the numbers, which was about the stupidest thing I could have said. <laughs> and I was fortunately only 26, so I learned a harsh lesson really early. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't actually even a true statement that I made, because I actually really enjoy, mm -hmm. you know, getting into the numbers, and I like the data to help tell the story. I am more of a storyteller than a data analyst, I will say that. And so from that moment on, I always made it a point to make sure I understood how to speak finance language. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the programs that I went through, I made sure that I you know, had a strong focus on financial acumen. And, and then I think over time, it was just about understanding what the CFO's you know, pain points are and what he or she is responsible for. And because we've all got a job to do, right? We're all held accountable for a job. And the more that I put myself in the shoes of the CFOs that I've worked with over time, the more it's helped me to think about, okay, if I was him or her, uh, what would I want my HR partner to come and speak with me about? I'm also very conceptual. So I would go in there with all these great ideas and, you know, his head would be exploding. And so I learned over time to come in with a bit of a framework of a plan, um, and so that helped too. <laughs> um, but, you know, every job that I've had, uh, I, I think I've learned a little bit more about how to influence versus just throw buzzwords out there. And then my, my last job immediately prior to Darden, I was supporting the timeshare division. So that taught me how to sell really, really well. So all of those things combined, I think that um, Raj, our CFO and I, we sit next to each other. We have a great relationship. Mm -hmm. He's a very people-centric CFO. I think people think that doesn't exist. It does a lot. Um, and I think CFOs have come to understand that you know mm -hmm. people really are an asset on the balance sheet, and if you don't take care of them, especially after going through the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, you win or lose market share in our environment based on the guest experience. So That's we've right. got to have the best people working in our restaurants every single day. That's right. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Beth, you want to bring us home? Oh, let's see. So the relationship with finance is always an interesting one. Um, speaking their language, mm -hmm. uh, understanding what it is that they're looking for. I find that I always start with the data to tell the mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what they're going to ask for. You need to understand what it is that they need. Um, you might have to ask lots of questions uh, to get to the clear answer and just constantly be sending them the data. Um, they will eventually get to the answer that they want, but the more that you work with them, the closer you work with them, um, you can really have foster that really strong relationship because it is important. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that are helping to finance <laughs> all of the investments that we want to make in our people. Um, I find that it's important for uh, me in particular to go and sit down with them, pre-socialize changes mm -hmm. before I even take it up to the CEO. Uh, make sure that they're aligned. They ask really good questions. Um, they love a well thought out plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, they like to see that you've done your homework um, and that you've got it pulled together for them. And a lot of times they help us make that recommendation, that business case even stronger before we take it on to the CEO to get alignment there. Um, and we do the same type of internal alignment uh, exercise with our other operational leaders as well. So it's not just finance. Don't be shy about building the relationships across the business, um, reaching out to those operational partners as well. Um, it really takes a team effort and a village to pull it all together and be successful as a company. So that's what's been successful for us. That's wonderful. So I, I heard speak their language multiple times. I heard plan, partner, have a plan, be structured. And then uh, what I love is you also all, in one way or another, built empathy mm -hmm. into your answers as well, having empathy for where, where different parts of the organization, whether it be finance or operations, are coming from and, and how to work with them, which I feel like is sort of the secret weapon of great HR folks is having that empathy anyway, so you can use your gift. Well, with that, 
I want to say thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. And I want to say to Ben, I hope that was everything that you wanted and <laughs> hoped and dreamed of Happy out birthday, of your birthday ben. gift. That's right. Happy birthday, Ben. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you.